Chapter 34 is uh, not a long chapter as far as the book of Isaiah is concerned. Uh, it is a book, uh, I'm sorry, I meant to say a chapter that is very important, not only to the book of Isaiah, but to uh, the Bible as a whole, as each chapter of the Bible is important. I want us to read Isaiah chapter 34, but to begin with, I want us to read just the first two verses, then we'll pray, and then we'll go back and look at the chapter. Isaiah 34, verses 1 and 2. Come near, ye nations, to hear, and hearken, ye people. Let the earth hear, and all that is therein, the world, and all things that come forth of it. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations, and his fury upon all their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them, he hath delivered them to the slaughter. Now call your attention particularly to the beginning part of verse 2, where it says, For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations. God is going to judge this world. There is no question about it. There is no doubt about it. It's coming. And that's what we're going to read about this evening. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you for your words, so clear and so plain. And Lord, we just pray that your Holy Spirit would guide us into all truth this evening. Help us to have an understanding and help us to act upon that which we learn. And help us, Lord, to be better servants of yours. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know about you, but quite often as I've talked to people to try to witness to them, I, I hear objections. And one of the objections I've heard often is, well, if there's this God who exists, this God you claim exists, if he's real, and if he's holy, and if he's good, and he's all-powerful, why does he allow so much evil in the world? And why does he allow so much uh, of inhumanity between people? Well, there a number of good answers to that. One is God does allow bad things to happen. It's not so much that God causes bad things to happen. There's a difference. Yes, but if he's all-powerful, couldn't he stop those bad things? He could. He could. Well, then why doesn't God do something about the evil in the world? Okay, legitimate question. Here's the answer to that. Number one, he has done something about it. Number two, he will do something about it. Number three, though you may not see it and understand it, he is doing something about it. All three of those are correct. First of all, God sent us a Savior, and that's the, the first thing that you need to know because of our sinful condition and the wickedness of our hearts. That's what we talked about this morning. Secondly, God has judged sin in the past and sinful people, individuals, sinful nations. There's no question about that. God is working in the world today, and God is going to judge the nations of this earth. So the answer to the question is, why doesn't God do something? He has, he is, and he will. Now having said that, we need to understand that God is a God of love, grace, and mercy. All of those. Uh, those are synonyms, but they're, they're not the same thing. Love is one thing, grace another, and the mercy a third. They are related, but they are not identically the same thing. And we need to know and understand that. So God is a God of love, grace, and mercy, but he is also holy. And his holiness has been violated by the sins of mankind. There's no question about that. I don't know about you, but I read of, of horrific things that people do to other people. And I'll be quite honest with you, I sometimes, let me rephrase that, I often read and hear about something and I say, how could one human being do that to another human being? This is horrific things. I read the other day where protesters, I can give you the quotation mark on that because it seems they were doing more than protesting, had mixed up milkshakes, and that belongs in quotation marks, and were tossing these milkshakes on people, but the milkshakes contain chemicals that cause damage to the skin and the eyes and could possibly cause somebody to go blind. Folks, that's not just a protest. That's an act of violence. There's no question about it. And I, I, that's just one thing that I heard just in the last few days. But every day it seems like you hear somebody doing something horrific to another person or other people. 
you think of, of terrorists and bombings and mass shootings and all of that. And you do realize that in many cases, I dare say most cases, when these things happen, the perpetrators don't even know their victims. Don't know who they are, don't know anything about them, and yet they just kill them or injure them indiscriminately. It's horrific. It's horrific. Now, here's what I'm saying. God's holiness has been violated. And God's holiness demands justice. You say, why doesn't God do something? Well, again, he has, he is, and he will. God's justice will be fulfilled. Justice demands payment for crimes committed. Either the criminal must pay or someone must pay for them. And that's exactly what we have in salvation. Jesus paid for our sins. He paid for our crimes. He prayed, paid for the things we've done wrong so that we may be forgiven and be saved. Sin must be judged. And God is going to judge sin. That's what chapter 34 is about. Again, chapter 35 is about restoration. We won't get there tonight, but uh, God will next week. In chapter 34, we're told of the judgment of the nations. Now, this is, without question, a prophecy of future events. Though it names some people who were alive in the time that Isaiah wrote this, it is primarily a prophecy that is yet to be fulfilled. But don't think for one moment that it will not be fulfilled. So many things that we read in Isaiah and the other prophets of the Old Testament have been fulfilled already and fulfilled with pinpoint accuracy. Now, so give me an example of that. All right, how about this? Down to the very year that Jesus would be born, down to the place that he would be born, uh, down to the words that he would speak on the cross, how he would die, how much would be paid to Judas Iscariot for betraying him. All of these are prophesied and fulfilled with exact accuracy. And that's, that's just a few. We could go much farther into depth with that. But God's going to call the nations into judgment. We read verses 1 and 2, but let's take a look again. Verse 1, come near ye nations to hear. God's calling the world to listen. And hearken, ye people, let the earth hear, and all that is therein, the entire world is called the world, and all things that come forth of it. The world is called to listen to this announcement. For the indignation of the Lord is upon, would you do this for me? Let me start that sentence again, and I want you to read the word after upon together with me. Will you do that? For the indignation of the Lord is upon all these nations. Who does that include? That includes all nations. Well, not ours. All nations. The indignation of the Lord is upon all nations. Oh, man, you and I, American, I'm about as far from that as you can get. I'm a very patriotic individual. I consider myself to be so. One man, uh, and a good man, I don't mean to say anything bad about this fellow. I have a great deal of respect for him. Good man. But uh, we were talking, just having a conversation a few months ago, and he said to me, he says, well, where in, in this, in your family, where does all this patriotism come from? And I, I was surprised at the question to him. Here's, I really was. I felt like saying, what do you mean? Why wouldn't we be? <laughs> That's kind of asking, like asking, why do you breathe? <laughs> it just it just seemed natural to me. But nonetheless, God's word says the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations, and his fury upon all their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them, he hath delivered them to the slaughter. God is going to call all nations into judgment. And this judgment upon all nations is typified. In this chapter, by prophecy concerning one nation, that one nation, again, this prophecy for all nations, one nation is called up here as an example of what God is doing and will do, has done, is doing, will do. Take a look at verse 3. Their slain shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses, and the mountains shall be melted 
with their blood. And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. And all their hosts shall fall down, as the leaf falleth off from the vine, and as a falling fig from the tree. My sword, for my sword shall be paid in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea, and upon the people of my curse to judgment. So God pronounces this judgment upon all nations. He talks about how he's going to destroy the armies of all nations. And when is he going to do that? Well, again, that's yet future. But then he mentions particularly Idumea. Now, Idumea is the, another name for Edom. Let's talk about who is Edom. Edom is a nation of the descendants of Esau. Abraham <coughs> begat Isaac, who was the son of the prophet. Um, well, I meant to say son of the prophecy, not prophet, prophecy. And then he had Ishmael, who was not the son of the prophecy, but the son of Abraham's will. So then Isaac has one son, I'm sorry, two sons, Jacob and Esau. Now they're twins. And Jacob, whose name meant supplanter and cheater from the time he was born, and he, as you know the story, he swindled uh, Esau out of his birthright, for Esau was born first. And there was anger and hatred among them until they did later in life get things resolved. But the promise to Abraham was that his children would have would, would be a great nation. The seed of Abraham, great nation. So you have Ishmael. The Ishmaelites are largely the Arabic people. Then you have uh, Jacob and Esau. Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, the father of the people of Israel. And Esau, the father of the Edomites, or the people of Idumea. Now, have we ever heard much about Idumea? Yes. Uh, King Herod the Great. The king at the time of Jesus' birth was from Idumea. And that's pretty interesting because he was king of the Jews. He had that title, king of Israel, king of the Jews. But he wasn't Jewish. He was an Idumean. He was a descendant of Esau, not a descendant of Jacob. Well, how is that possible? Because the Bible says that on the throne in Jerusalem, the kings would be a descendant of David, and he can't be a descendant of David if he's Idumean. Well, here's how that's possible. Herod did not inherit the throne, as many kings do. He was appointed to his position. He was appointed to his position by Caesar. He was chosen by the Romans to be the king over the conquered nation of Israel. So Herod, king of the Jews, is an idea. And as you know, when Jesus was born, Herod gave order to slaughter all baby boys in Bethlehem. I'm not saying this to try to be funny or score some kind of points with a catchy phrase. That's not my uh, idea at all. But I'm going to tell you, Herod, in killing all the baby boys in Bethlehem, was an early abortionist. There's no question about that. He slaughtered innocent children because he didn't want this newborn king to take over his throne. Now you have to think about this. Herod was not a young man when this happened. This child is born and he's afraid of this child taking over his throne. Well, Herod didn't even live to see Jesus come to maturity. By the time Jesus began in public ministry, Herod was long dead. So the point is, what was he afraid of? And yet, he committed this atrocity out of fear for his own sake. So this judgment is upon all nations, but I give you know, it's given as an example or illustration of the judgment that God is going to bring upon all nations. Well, what does that look like? Well, we've already seen some of it, but let's go on. Verse 6, the sword of the Lord is filled with blood. 
It is made fat with fatness, and with the blood of lambs and goats, and the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord hath a sacrifice in Bozrah, and a great slaughter in the land of Idumea. Bozrah is a city in Idumea. Here, uh, this reference in verse 6, the blood of lambs and goats, the fat and kidneys, that all refers to the sacrifices. So God is saying it's going to be like a sacrifice that you would make in worship. Verse 7, and the unicorns shall come down with me. Oh, stop right there, preacher. That's what I'm done right there. Unicorns. We all know unicorns are mythological creatures. There's no such thing as a unicorn, and that proves that your Bible isn't accurate, and we just can't go any farther. Well, let me help you with that. The word unicorn there, you think, well, that means a pretty little horse that maybe has wings, and, and maybe is pink and blue color, uh, and, and, and has this... Uh, Candy striped horn thrown out of its forehead and so forth, and that's the image you get. The word unicorn here simply means one horned animal. Now, here's my question to you Are there any one horned animals in the world? If you think about it, you can say, Well, yeah, as a matter of fact, they're all okay, good enough, unicorns. That's all it means, one horned animal. It doesn't necessarily mean a little pretty horse with, with a horn thrown out of its head and brightly colored and maybe wings. And and this fulfills all your fantasies. Doesn't mean that. Doesn't mean the great white horse that you see lying out of the movie screen. Doesn't mean that. It means a one more day. So the unicorns shall come down with them, and the bullocks with the bulls, and their land shall be soaked with blood. What land? The land of Idumea or Edom. And their dust shall be made fat with fatness. Watch verse 8 carefully, for it is the day of the Lord's vengeance. You will read many times in Scripture the phrase, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a day of judgment. This is the same thing that's being talked about here in verse 8. The day of the Lord's vengeance. It is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses. Why? For the controversy of Zion. What is the controversy of Zion? Zion is the hill upon which Jerusalem sits. It is a reference to Jerusalem. It is a reference to the holy city. It is the city where God has placed his name. What are the controversies of Zion? All of those who have attacked and conquered and wanted to destroy Jerusalem. God is going to judge all the nations who have attacked Jerusalem. We'll stop right there and preach it. Now you showed us earlier in fact, in verse 2, that this indignation is upon all nations. Now, not all nations have attacked Jerusalem, and that's true. But you remember that this prophecy has not yet been fulfilled. There is coming, and another night, we don't have time to get into great detail on this tonight, but there is coming at least World War III. What do you mean at least World War III? Well, we've had World War I and World War II. There's going to be at least one more world war. There could be more than one. Well, how do you mean there could be more than one? Well, Jesus said you're going to hear wars and rumors of wars up to the end. So how do I know that we're not going to see something close again to World War I or World War II happen again? I don't know that. What I do know, though, is that in the end times, there's going to be a conglomerate of nations, a coalition of nations that are going to assemble together and attack Jerusalem. And the Lord himself is going to descend and fight for the people of Israel and conquer the nations of the world. So that will at least be World War III. Honestly, it might be World War IV or V. I don't know. But it would at least be World War III. Does that make sense to you? I hope so. So it's the, verse 8 again, it's the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. Those who have persecuted Israel, those who have wanted to destroy Jerusalem, will not go unpunished. One night we'll, we'll do a study on the lineup of the nations. Uh, again, not time to do that tonight. But you'll see, I think, exactly how it talks about the nations of today. Verse 9, And the streams thereof, the streams of the land of Idumea, shall be turned into pitch, and the dust thereof into brimstone. We talked about this 
recently. What is brimstone? We use that word a lot. Most people today don't know what oh, brimstone is. Hell and fire and brimstone is what you preachers always talk about. Well, what is brimstone? You know, in Revelation 21 and 8, it says, But the fearful and the unbelieving, and all, uh, sorcerers and idolaters and whoremongers and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. But that doesn't answer the question. What is brimstone? Brimstone is hot molten rock. Or you might say lava. Hot lava. That's what brimstone is. When the volcano erupts, it spews out all that hot molten rock. That's, that's brimstone. So, again, verse 9, Isaiah 34, 9, And the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch, the dust thereof into brimstone, and the land thereof shall become burning pitch. What's it sound like to you? It sounds like the land's going to be burned up. Verse 10, It shall not be quenched night nor day, the smoke thereof shall go up forever, from generation to generation it shall lie waste, and none shall pass through it forever and ever. In the Revelation it says that the torment of those who have turned against God, who fought against God, the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. Very similar language. And then what is left of the country of Idumea will be occupied not by people, but by animals. Like what? Verse 11. For the cormorant and the bittern shall possess it, the owl also and the raven shall dwell in it, and he shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. They shall call the nobles thereof to the kingdom, but none shall be there, and all her princes shall be nothing. When they call the nations together, nobody stands up. Nobody comes to the United Nations from Idumea. Nobody comes to any other meeting from Idumea. Why? There is no Idumea today. It is gone. It has been, oh, the land's still there. There's no country. Thirteen and the thorns shall come up in her palaces, nettles and brambles in the fortresses thereof. It shall be an habitation of dragons. Oh, there you go again. Preacher, we are a mythological preacher. Hmm. Let me help you with that. Around 1850, a British scientist coined a new word. Prior to that, this word had never been in the English language. Before he came up with this new word, the word refers to animals, certain animals, certain type of animals. Before he coined this new word, everybody in the world knew about these animals. He didn't discover the animals. He just gave a new name. And before that, everybody in the world knew about these animals, and they called them dragons. Well, what was the new name? Dinosaurs. Came up with the name dinosaur, which means what? Terrible wizard. <laughs> so what are you saying? Dragons are dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are dragons. Real simple. Well, now that's well a good preacher, but I got you on another thing. This is talking about just a few thousand years ago, and dinosaurs all died out 60 million years ago. Really? Can you prove that? Oh yeah. How do you prove it? Well, the strata of the rock that they they found it. Well, then why are dinosaur fossils found in different rock strata? Is it all 60 million years old? Because if it is, why isn't it all at the same level? If it isn't, is it? See, there's too many holes in that theory. No, it's quite reasonable to assume that in biblical times, there were still some dinosaurs living. Now, let me tell you what I do not think. Uh, I think there could be some dinosaurs living to help. I mean, now I know you're wrong. No. Uh, let me, let me tell you this. I've told you this before, but let me run it by you again. About every couple of months, every two, three months at the longest, I read of science has discovered one of two things. Either A, a species of animals they didn't know ever existed before. That happens, I'm telling you, several times a year. 
you read about this. Not every day, but several times a year. So either they find a species of animal that they didn't know existed before, or they find animals existing that they thought had been extinct. And yet they are. Here they are. One of my favorite stories, I believe this was in New Zealand, uh, about, oh, it must be 15 years ago now. I read this and I just I had to laugh when I read the story. They had found a species of lizard living, I believe it was New Zealand, it might have been Australia, but I'm pretty sure it was New Zealand. They found a species of lizard living that they thought previously had been extinct for over a million years. Okay, you with me so far? And yet they found these lizards living. Previously, they've been extinct for many years. So they spent, no joke, $300,000 doing a study to just figure out whether these lizards were reproducing or not. That's hilarious to me. <laughs> because there's only one of two possibilities. Either, yes, they're obviously reproducing, or you're looking at these lizards that are a million years old now, which is it? And how hard is that to figure out? you got to spend 300000 to figure that out. Obviously, they're reproducing. I mean, you can't, you can't get around that. Remember what we read in Romans 1 today? Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. So this kind of thing happens all the time. So could there be a few dinosaurs alive? There could be. Have you ever seen one? No. Uh, you ever seen a picture of one? I think so. Oh, you do? Yeah, I do. 1977, a Japanese fishing crawler pulled up the carcass of an animal uh, out of the ocean. It was had been dead for a long time. How long? It was so decayed and so rotting and smelled so bad that they couldn't save it. They had to drop it back in the water. But before they did, they photographed it. And the Japanese government said this is a plesiosaur, plesiosaur, and they issued a commemorative postage stamp with a picture of a plesiosaur on it to commemorate the occasion. Now, in recent years, people come off and say, oh, I don't know, that was no plesiosaur, that was a whale shark. I have seen this photograph and looked at it, and that is no shark. I'm, I'm not a sea life, uh, don't have a doctorate in, in, in oceanography or anything of that sort, marine biology. But I'm telling you that was no shark. <laughs> well, how do you know? Well, for one thing, sharks don't have long necks. You think about that. That by itself. So yes, they hauled up the carcass of a plesiosaur. When? 1977. You don't have to take my word for it. Look it up. It's there. Well, yeah, but there's no, that's a whale shark. It is not a whale shark. You look at a whale shark, go back and look at that picture. You'll see what I'm telling you. Yes, sir. I have a picture of it. Okay. Yeah, it's not hard to come by. The point that I'm getting across to you is could there be dinosaurs? Or there could be. Are there? I don't know. Could be. Now, here's what I don't believe I don't believe that there's anywhere on the planet that you're going to find Jurassic Park. I really don't. Where it's all there, there are just thousands of dinosaurs going around. Probably not. But does that mean there couldn't be any? No, it doesn't. Doesn't mean that at all. So when the Bible says dragons are there, we are safe to believe that there are dragons. There were dragons when Isaiah made this prophecy. This prophecy is of the future, and the fact of the matter is there'll be dragons there. Which ones? Tyrannosaurus rex? I don't know. Maybe little ones. Who knows? All we know is what God said, and we're going to trust what God says. So again, verse 13, thorns shall come up. In her palaces, nettles, and rambles, and the fortresses thereof, it shall be an habitation of dragons and a court for owls. 14. The wild beast of the desert shall also meet with the wild beast of the island, and the satyr shall cry to his fellow. The screech owl also shall rest there and find for herself a place of rest. And there shall the great owl make her nest and lay and hatch and gather under her shadow. There shall be, uh, there shall the vultures also be gathered, everyone with their mate. So God is saying what's happening, going to happen to Idumea, is it's going to be left so desolate that only wild animals live there. 
And kind of a strange combination. I mean, do you know what? That's exactly what I would make his life today. Nobody lives there. People go there. People go there. Tourists go there all the time. Uh, I'd say, if not every week, probably every day. Every day, possibly every week is what I meant to say. But what they don't find is it being inhabited. It is a barren wasteland, just as God said it. Notice the first phrase of verse 16. Isaiah says, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. Now, Isaiah is writing this. He's writing his scroll of Isaiah. By the way, that was oldest complete book, the oldest complete manuscript of any book of the Bible is the book of Isaiah. Uh, they may find something else in some day. They find new stuff all the time, new old stuff all the time. But the fact of the matter is, to date, the longest scroll, the most complete scroll of any Bible book is the book of Isaiah. <coughs> back thousands of years. Now here's what I'm trying to share with you. Isaiah says, seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. What book is he talking about? He's talking about the body of scripture as it existed at that time. Now, all of the Bible hadn't been written yet. Isaiah's writing. That means Daniel hasn't written yet. That means Jeremiah and Ezekiel haven't written yet. That means the minor prophets haven't written yet. But you've got all of the Bible prior to that. The law and the history and the poetry books, they're all there. And what Isaiah is saying here is this. Read the book of the Lord. Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. No one of these shall fail. None shall want her mate. For my mouth uh, it hath commanded, and his spirit it hath gathered them. Now that is, again, a very, very important statement. What's being said here is this. Not one of these prophecies is going to fail. No one of these prophecies shall fail. None shall want her meat. Now it's going to be about fulfillment. Every one will be fulfilled. Why? God says, My mouth it hath commanded, and his spirit it hath gathered them. Gathered what? Gathered the prophecies together. You know what happens? In the years following this, the century, the millennia following this, all the scriptures are gathered together and assembled into what today we call the Bible. And that's exactly the prophecy that's being made here in verse 16. So Isaiah can say, both to the people living in his day and the people of all time, seek ye out the book of the Lord and read it. Do you need a clear statement to tell you to read your Bible? Well, here it is. And that no prophecy of God shall fail. So shall these things in this chapter come to pass? There's no question about it. God's word is eternal. God's prophecies do come to pass. And this is one of the great evidences of the truth of the Bible's fulfilled prophecy. So verse 17, And he hath cast the lot for them, and his hand hath divided it unto them by line. They shall possess it forever. From generation to generation shall they dwell therein. God's people are going to dwell in Jerusalem forever. Well, for that to happen, what happens with all the time Jerusalem's been destroyed? Now, you know, with all the destructions of Jerusalem, there's never been a time when none of the Jewish people or people of Israel live there. There have been times when it's been under other control. Many centuries it's been under other control. From the time of the end of the Old Testament, up until 1948, it was not under Israeli control. First the Babylonians, and then the Medes and the Persians, and then the Greeks, and then the Romans. Later on, the, the Muslims overran Jerusalem. The British controlled Jerusalem. Many nations have controlled Jerusalem. But there's never been a time when there were no Israelis living there. Now, you listen to some people say, oh, no, 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 they're squatters. They just came in recently. That's not true. Not true. 
And God says it never will be true. But it goes beyond that. It goes to the fact that God says that he's going to make a new Jerusalem. A new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem. And that will last forever. Now here's some things we have to take into consideration of what we've just heard. God uses Idumea there as an example of what he's planning for all nations. God is going to bring his judgment upon the entire world. Is that the Great Tribulation period? It certainly has to do with the Great Tribulation period, and yet there is a war after the Great Tribulation period that is even larger. Now you have to understand this. God made a covenant with Abraham. And God said to Abraham, I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. All these folks who have attacked Jerusalem, who have attacked the Israelis, who have attacked and wanted to eliminate the Jew, are going to come under God's judgment. And all nations that have fought against them, or that will fight against them, are going to come under God's judgment. Why? Because of God's righteous nature, because of God's holiness, because of God keeping his word, and because God stands to his promise to Israel, to Abraham. Now, folks, what does that have to do with you and I sitting here today? Well, great deal. Number one, this chapter gives us tremendous faith, or I should say reason to increase our faith in God's word. The surety of it, and how even the prophecy of the assembly of the scriptures is given here. But in addition to that, and very important to understand this, it tells us what God is going to do, and God is going to judge the wickedness of this world. Numbers 32, 23. People of Israel were about to enter the Promised Land. They're on the east side of the Jordan River. They're getting ready to cross over into the land. Before they cross over, and before Moses died, Two and a half tribes went to Moses. Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh went to Moses. And they said, you know, we know the Lord has given us the land over there on the west side of the Jordan. But we've been here on this east side for a while. We like it here. Would you ask the Lord, they're saying to Moses, would you ask the Lord to let us stay here? Moses did. Moses went to the Lord and seated for them and presented their request, the Lord said, yes, they can stay there on this condition. When the rest of the nation of Israel goes in to possess the land, those two and a half tribes need to send their men in the forefront of the battle. They need to lead the way. They need to lead the troops and go in and conquer the land. They leave their wives, their children, their cattle back home, and they go out and they lead the way. And after the land is conquered, then they can go back home and they can rest in that land. And they did that. But God gives them a warning after Moses has passed away. Now Joshua is ready to lead the people in. He gives them a warning in Numbers 32, 23, regarding this promise that they made. He said, if I will keep my word. If you will do what I instructed you, I'll keep my word, and this shall be your home. But if you will not do so, the verse says, if you will not do what you told the Lord you would do, Behold, you have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. What does that mean? That means you don't do wrong and get away with it. Now, you, you can be forgiven. We're not talking saying you can't be forgiven. What we're saying is sin doesn't go unpunished. Either we accept Christ's payment for our sins, or we pay for our sins. One way or the other. And what this chapter teaches us is the sins of mankind, the sins of the human race, shall not go unpunished. Those who come to Christ for forgiveness will be forgiven. There's no question about that. We're not, we're not diminishing forgiveness. But the world as a whole that rejects Christ will perish. The wages of sin is death. This is what we were talking about in the morning. So it is impressed upon us, since we have God's word, with the promise that all the prophecies of God's word are going to be fulfilled, 
and that all God's word would be assembled, and it has been, and we have it, then we need to go with the message of God's word to a world that is under condemnation. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, he came not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Because he has not believed in the only begotten Son of God. The world needs to know that. Every tribe and kindred and nation needs to know that. Every language needs to know that. Because the judgment of God is coming. Preacher, now you start to sound like one of those fire and brimstone preachers. Well, good. I'm not shouting. I'm not carrying on. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. I'm not saying I'm not doing it, but here's the thing. Fire and brimstone is coming. <laughs> you can count on it. God's judgment is going to fall. I said several times we don't have time to go that line up of the nation, but you can find it in Ezekiel chapter 38. And you're going to find there that some of the nations that are going to attack Israel, whom God himself is going to fight, would be Russia, Iran, called Persia there, Germany, <coughs> Turkey, other nations that are in the news today are going to line up in a great coalition attack Jerusalem and God is going to fight against them. Again, you want to look it up, Ezekiel 38. You can read it for yourself. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you that we know that while you are our Savior and you are a God of love and mercy and grace and forgiveness. Lord, you're also the God of holiness and righteousness. We cannot abide sin and will not allow the sin to go unpunished. Lord, our world is spinning on towards the day of the Lord, the day of God's judgment. Help us, Lord. Help us to pray for the lost. Help us to reach out to the lost. Help us to do everything we can to share your gospel that others might be saved. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation. God spoke into your heart. The altar's here if you need it. Father, bless and move in this time, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand again. Hymn number 397.